My guest today is John Paul Lederach, who is the author of uh, the book Reconcile, which is actually a reissue of a book that came out earlier, uh, but now has a uh, new foreword and some updates to it. Uh, and he looks at different ways in which we can uh, use our, our faith, uh, our Christian faith in particular, uh, to heal some of the seemingly pervasive brokenness in the world. Uh, so thanks for coming on and uh, talking to us. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Yeah. So when this book first came out in, was it 1999? Mm -hmm. Yes. Under uh, a different title. Yeah, The Journey Toward Reconciliation was the original title. Okay. And uh, then why was it that you decided at this point to reissue the book under a new title, Reconcile? Well, it, it's had a, a fairly good reading, um, primarily in the Mennonite uh, Anabaptist communities, which it was, I wrote it specifically kind of to my own church tradition. Mm. Um, so there were a number of references that went in that direction. Uh, recently, the last year or so, uh, the book was actually picked up, um, particularly by Bill Hybels out of Willow Creek and began to gain more interest and attraction around the topic of reconciliation in places they were working uh, both in Chicago and particularly in, uh, abroad in Middle East and Africa. And we thought that it was time for an update and I rewrote probably I would say the first uh, four or five chapters have major uh, completely redone revisions and a couple of chapters that were added and then other portions of the book were sort of woven in differently than they were. So it's, it's, it really represents a somewhat new uh, edition mm. uh, of the theme. And it updates considerably, you know, a lot of the examples that I used were coming from my experiences in the 1980s and early 90s. And so there's much more of, a, of an updating into some of the contemporary um, experiences and situations that we have as well. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think uh, is the 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 element of it, or why why do you understand that the the Bill and Lynn Hybels, uh have uh, who have such tremendous influence, uh, really? Uh, why have they resonated so strongly with the book to to become such advocates for it, and and even to write the foreword for the new book? Yeah. Well, I I have not had opportunity to sit down and talk at great length with them personally, so I'm mm. speculating from the correspondence that we've had in phone conversations, etc. Um, Lynn, in particular, had early on become quite engaged in a couple of locations where they were doing international work, with the fact that the communities um, communities here writ large, not not exclusively the Christian community, but the communities where their partners and colleagues uh, were based, were facing such deep-rooted and divisive conflict. And she began to, I think, really raise those questions that Bill immediately gravitated toward as they started to look for how it, the Christian message is relevant to those forms of social conflict. And I'm talking here of places like the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, which has, you know, decades of absolute enormous violence and uh, human atrocity. And then, of course, in parts of the Middle East where they have been also working. And I think that the book, when they first came to it, provided uh, a, a theological and biblical grounding. But it also has always had, because my work has always been in that direction, I'm a practitioner, a scholar, much more than a scholar, a practitioner. Um, it has a real uh, applied and practical focus that moves across different levels of human experience, from interpersonal and family and church up to social conflict that I tend to do a lot of work with. And I think that that um, combination of things is what they found particularly appealing. Um, that it had real relevancy to immediate situations in the congregations where they are pastoring and working, but it also had, uh, I think, applied relevance to the social conflicts that are so divisive and often far, far too violent that have lasted for such long periods of times in many parts of the world. And that this, for, for them, at least as they've explained it to me, it, it became... 
far more clear to them how central the theme of reconciliation is to the Christian message. Um, that that was always present, but never, it, until you really are in the middle of really deep and, and painful, painful, violent conflict, sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't resonate quite as deeply as when you are living with people or are close to people that are really suffering. And I think that's, um, at least that combination of things is what they have often pointed to. Mm. Well, and that, that kind of leads me to another question about a story that you share, a personal story you share in the, early in the book about your work in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. um, and at which point some, uh, I guess, anonymous insurgent groups mm -hmm. uh, uh, contacted you and threatened your family. And it, it, it was very formative for you uh, in not just uh, how you do your work, but also how you understand particular parts of Scripture, like John 3.16. I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the context was in the 1980s, and I was involved uh, Central American-wide. Uh, there were three open uh, wars that were unfolding during that decade, uh, Nicaragua, Salvador, and Guatemala. And I worked a lot with um, both church leaders and more grassroots and community-based leadership that was facing very difficult situations of, you know, living through a war period. And, and we were living, our family was living in Costa Rica, though most of the work that was taking me into Nicaragua, which was uh, very close at hand, the um, the Nicaraguan War had numerous um, forms of armed uh, opposition groups, but the ones that I worked with uh, as part of a religiously based mediation team was between the east coast of Nicaragua and essentially the indigenous uprising and the Sandinista government that was in power at the time. The, the, the anonymity that you refer to is that we began to get, uh, all of us on the mediation team began to get threats, uh, some directly to our well-being, in other words, we get assassination threats and threats that we should leave and quit. A lot of that was pushed by people who were not interested in having negotiations be successful at that particular time period. Um, it, took, it ratcheted up considerably for our family. Uh, when I had l left uh, to go to a series of meetings, and when I returned back to Costa Rica, um, it, we received a phone call that was give, revealing to us the news that they had thought that, uh, that our daughter had been kidnapped. I, and that's, I placed that in the past to say that when the phone call came, the person calling thought that the act had already taken place, that... that um, and our daughter at the time was about two and a half years old. Um, and, of course, my wife would have been at home with her alone, but there were a series of very unusual circumstances by which she was waiting for the arrival of her mother at an airport. The plane was late, so she ended up not being at the house for about 12 hours. And that was the period where it was supposed to happen. It put into motion a whole series of things because these, uh, while these may sound outrageous as for, for the normal person, when you're in these settings where there is a lot of um, um, political and economic interest and a lot of poverty and suffering, um, things can happen very quickly that you, you have to take account of. And, and for me, to come to your point, I can remember very clearly laying in bed right after that phone call trying to get my daughter to go to sleep and reflecting on the question of, you know, what had I as a father gotten us into? You know, was, was peace in Nicaragua even remotely close to losing my daughter or having our family torn completely apart as the case would have been? And that, that had, you know, that sort of an impact when you're living in the middle of it. If you go back and begin to look at Scripture, the biblical message, you suddenly read the things that I had heard growing up. You know, it was the first Bible verse I would have memorized from my grandparents down. You know, it was John 3.16. When you reread it, laying in that bed with your daughter laying beside you, and you're asking yourself that question, you suddenly see in that verse that um, the parent figure uh, gave up the most precious thing that a parent could possibly have, right? But not in favor of a friend. <laughs> it, was, it was actually 
on behalf of reconciling and finding a way to restore the relationships with those who had gone enormous distance, uh, who were enemies, so to say. And I've never been able to go back to some of that basic scripture in quite the same way because I think what it, and part of the book pushes out some of this, um, we often think about reconciliation within our church circles primarily as reconciling with those who are within the church or those who are outside coming into the church in some form. Mm -hmm. What's much harder for us to wrap our heads around is what it means to have love for the enemy, which we know is a very concrete teaching of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it was so concrete because he, he lived it. He applied it in his almost every action. He was constantly reaching out across the lines of division uh, into enemy camps, so to say. And that sort of love... Uh, is one that's enormously challenging. And, and so for me, where that really took on a whole different light was living through a circumstance where actually I, I would, have, would have been in a place that I could have lost a daughter. Mm -hmm. And it came very, very close to being so. And then the question becomes, how do, you, how do you respond to that? How do you respond to the sort of vocational sense that you have about what's the right thing to do? How do you respond to those who you know were probably involved in it, that in weeks that followed, in months that followed, I actually was within, you know, with, with them, close to them, knew, knew I, we all knew where it traced to and who, who was involved. And uh, how, how do you interact with a world that has that kind of threat? And I think the biggest choice we have is between the choice of fear and love. And to live by love, um, requires you to walk toward fear in a way that you, uh, as we know the verse, to cast out, so to say, the sense of it, but you, you still have it very present with you. It, it doesn't, it's not like it sun, suddenly disappears, but it's a choice. It's a, it's a movement that you're making, and it's a movement in part that is about envisioning the other as having something of God with and in them. That is to see the face of God even in the enemy. And it, it seems that at the heart of that um, recognition uh, or discernment practice uh, for you is personal narrative, uh, storytelling. Absolutely. And I wonder, uh, because on the surface, the way that stories have been distilled down as like, uh, you know, distractions or children's, uh, you know, stories, but not really anything that adults engage in. Where where is the real power for reconciliation in that personal story? Yeah, well, it's both uh, obviously embedded in the personal story, but it's also embedded in the process of storytelling. We we live into the stories we tell about ourselves and about others, mm. and um, actually, a very big part of of peace building and of reconciliation requires the capacity to engage deeply with listening to another's experience, another's life story, the way they've gotten to where they've arrived, how their perceptions are formed, what they're based on. Con con conflict is not so much uh, a matter of just locating the facts and then logically and rationally you know, making a good decision and it all goes away. Conflict is composed of the way human beings make meaning of the world. And the way we make meaning of the world is by way of story, by way of the things that we take account of, we notice, that we bring forward, how we frame those, how, how we make sense of those. And that really is where the biggest part of a lot of this work um, sits. It's, it's about developing a capacity for deep and patient listening and really seeking out relationships, uh, coming alongside accompaniment of people as their as their story unfolds and the way their story unfolds is very much wrapped up in who, where they've come from and how they see that world that they live in how they see themselves and others and I think that so for me the the, the sharing of personal story um, I think it was Carl Rogers that once said that which is most personal is most universal mm -hmm. and so where we really touch the sense of who we are as human beings is very much wrapped up in how we see our narratives and the ways that we bring those to the world. And so a lot of what I do in my teaching and in my work is actually about forms of storytelling and story listening, which is, uh, I think, one of the, 
one of the hard things to do actually in this work is to have the patients to really listen well. Mm -hmm. It seems like such a simple act, uh, but, but I can guarantee you it, 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 it's a little easier when you're listening the first time to something you've never heard before, but it becomes a lot more um, complex when, when one of several things happen. One is when you yourself are wrapped up in that story and you have a, a need to clarify, defend, or justify. Mm -hmm. So your listening gets cut short quickly because you're moving on immediately to whatever the answer is you feel you need to give to something that you don't think is true or that didn't capture it. And to have the patience to sit with someone else's story that is about in part you and what you've done, Nothing easy about that, <laughs> but I, 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 that particular kind of discipline I attach a little more closely to a form of prayer. I think, I think that we, for example, only listen to God as well as we're capable of listening to each other, particularly when we disagree, which is a very hard thing to say, uh, in part because what if God is, is revealing something to us that we're not ready to hear? And if we are behaving in ways that we shut down, we're actually cutting off the possibility of deeper understanding. Uh, the second is that when you work in places where conflict has lasted a long time, you will soon find that people have a real need to, to, to correct everything and to give you the right story, and they will repeat themselves quite often over and over again things that you've heard. And I, you know, for some people, they just want to move, you know, let's get past this, let's get on, let's, you know, it's time to get, get moving here. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we fall back into a view that says, you know, the whole, this would be taken care of if we would just apply, you know, forgive and forget. Uh, just forget all that stuff, forgive and get on with your life, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But in reality, um, what, what people are doing is they're coming back through a, a lot of that is that they're, they're testing things that don't have much to do w with the content of what they're saying. I mean, the content is a certain level of the conversation. What they're really testing, I think, is a deeper question of who are you and who am I? And do I matter to you? Mm -hmm. And a as you create the patience and the space to listen deeply, people will often start to get in touch with another level of their own experience. Uh, the trust will begin to emerge in small, tiny pieces, and those small, tiny pieces sometimes permit ways in which a deeper conversation can unfold. Conversation they're trying to have at times with themselves. Where, where am I going? How do I get out of this? What, you know, what, if, particularly if it's in a, in a religious or, or a Christian setting, what, what is God asking of me at this particular time? What, you know, what's being revealed here? And those things are not always easy to get past kind of the hard outer surface that we create to protect ourselves. And the stories often float around that, but they're trying to get to something deeper. And that takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of, I think, listening, um, uh, which is one of the core practices and arts that I think that we need to develop much more as a spiritual discipline and not exclusively kind of a technical uh, decision-making decision. Mm -hmm. So there are these historically almost intractable uh, areas of conflict where you work, <clears throat> but then there are also these uh, relatively peaceful communities here in our own backyard, so to speak, uh, like Ferguson, Missouri, mm. uh, with uh, where uh, Michael Brown uh, was recently shot, and we it it raises these uh, these painful issues for us that a lot of people, like you said, would would just like to say, well, we're past that, we're in a post-racial society, you know, class issues, race issues, that just mm -hmm. aren't as big a deal as they used to be, and yet we're seeing evidence to the contrary of that. So if you were the mediator for that community, what, what would you bring to them to try and get uh, people past some of the divisions and the, you know, the, the tensions and even potential violence that's stirring around that case? Yeah. Well, it's a great question, and I, I, I very much agree with you that we don't have to go far to find um, the context within which reconciliation is relevant. Uh, it's not just in the Middle East, so to say, we see portrayed different times on our radio and TV stations, but very much in our own backyards. Um, so a couple of things in reference to this. I think the first one is to have a, a sense of, 
um, uh, about time as you approach these. So you're going to have some elements that are about immediate crisis and mitigating further escalation of violence. And you're going to have some elements of this that trace into a much more expanded time frame both toward the past and toward the future. And that's really, really key because too often we head into these as if the short-term thing, if we can just figure out a way to extricate ourselves and get this calmed down, it'll be over. Mm -hmm. But in reality, um, at, a much bigger, at a much bigger picture, um, that context of the long history and the long future are the relational underpinnings, the relational context within which these crises emerge. And so what, what we would hope for is that that crisis can serve as an opportunity to do two things. One, in the short term, to find ways to lower the escalation of violence. But the second, and equally if not more important, is to open up a new form of approaching the relational context. And in the case of, of Ferguson, as a case in point, it could be that in other contexts it's around religion or other forms of identity. Um, those are really about asking deeper questions of that I just mentioned. Who, who are we, where do we come from, and where are we going? The, these are big questions that beg a, a careful look at the way our relationships have been structured, that have, for one reason or another, provided for uh, forms of exclusion, humiliation, lack of human dignity, if you will, at its core. And I think that you can see over and again how those things are being portrayed in parts on the streets of Ferguson. It's, it's like a cry for acknowledgement, for forms of truth-telling, for forms of, 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 of uh, reinvigorating this with a sense of, of basic human dignity and respect. And that that is a big part of what's happened, I think, across race relations in, in the U.S., is that we, we tend... Um, Younger generations, mine included, uh, can tend very easily to sort of outsource responsibility for all that past. You know, that's things they used to do. It's no longer like that. But what I found rather consistently is that people who have suffered enormous injustice in one form or another tend to have a long memory about that. It's transgenerational. Mm -hmm. But people who have been privileged or benefited in some form have a very short memory about the responsibilities that their generational patterns may have had in reference to that. And I think that we, to a large degree, one of the arguments I've made that comes primarily from my interpretation of, of biblical narrative and story is that actually long memory and a, and a significant meaningful hope for the future is very much a part of the biblical story. It's an expanded view of time, right? Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a short view of time. And that uh, comes very much then to the core of the notion that the idea that uh, forgiveness is somehow attached to forgetfulness, in other words, that we forget and forgive, mm -hmm. uh, should be shifted in a different direction, which would be to remember and change, which are the two big biblical motifs. To remember who you were as a stranger in a lost land, to remember where you've come from, the times that you have suffered, and to change, to transform. It's a transformational story that is a lifelong journey, and that that's actually very much at the core, but it requires you being in relationship with people that permit you to engage in that kind of narrative and story. And I think that there, there is the, the case in point that would say, uh, you know, Ferguson, the, the thing that's key there probably is to find sets of people within the situation who have a deep sense of where they've come from in that community, but who are open and willing to enter into a longer-term relationship that's asking the question, who do we really want to be as a community? And I don't think there's any greater gift than we can give ourselves than to actually develop relationships with people who are different than us, who don't even think like us, in fact, don't believe like us. And that if we exclusively uh, cast our relationships only to those who are thinking exactly like us, we tend to reduce the very nature of, of the message of, uh, of the Bible. Because it was a message that was brought primarily to find ways of reconstituting a broken uh, humanity and a broken um, creation. But that means the wholeness of the whole thing. <laughs> and so we, we tend to, you know, we tend to gravitate a lot of times in our 
uh, church circles toward narrower units of people that are more or less alike. And I think the real challenge is how, how can we choose to live with clarity about who we are, but in relationship with people that are really different. And that's, a big, that's, a, that's going to require an expanded view of, of, of time. So in, in essence, conflict creates opportunity. But it should not be an opportunity just to get rid of it. It should be an opportunity to find ways to lower the level of destructiveness, but to increase the level of relationships that permit us to change what it is that's not right in our relationships. Well, thank you very much for uh, talking me, to me today. The book is Reconcile by John Paul Lederach. It is now available everywhere uh, through Herald Press and uh, with a new, uh, very uh, very convincing, very compelling uh, forward, uh, dare I say, endorsement <laughs> mm -hmm. from Bill and Lynn Hybels as well, uh, who are strong champions of your work uh, mm -hmm. and your ideas. And uh, here's to hoping that uh, more and more people will listen to the message you have to share. Thank you very much, Christian. Appreciate it. Thank you. Peace.